exciting time. Man, we got kindergartners everywhere at both, all three services actually, getting Bibles. And uh, it's an exciting time because school is starting this week. That's probably exciting for a lot of parents. Maybe not as much for our kids, but uh, I think all across our city and state, we had some that started this past week. Most are starting this week. And, and I just think there's something really special and fun about going back to school because we all want to put our best foot forward, right? And it's not just our kids. It's not just our students. It's true for us as parents too, am I right? I mean, think about how many days of the school year do you put as much thought into your kids' outfits and their hairdos as you're currently doing for their first day this week? We've got our kids' first day this Tuesday. We've already got their their clothes picked out. Um, We'll probably be up early. We're going to feed them breakfast. We'll fix their hair. We'll pose for pictures. We will casually stroll off to school, arriving 10 or 15 minutes early. But by the third day of class this week, I suspect I will be yelling at my kids because we're going to be running behind. They won't have brushed their hair or their teeth, and I cannot promise you that their clothes are going to match. And it's not just with the start of school. It's really the start of anything, right? A new job, a new relationship, a new business partnership. No matter what it is, to some degree, all of us try really hard to put our best foot forward at the start of anything new. It's just what we do. But here's a reality for us. Even when we're trying to be at our very best, we are still from time to time going to have an embarrassing moment where we're trying really hard to make a good first impression. We're trying to network with the right people and make just the right impression, but we're going to just completely embarrass ourselves. And what's the best thing to do when you do that stupid, embarrassing thing? Well, it's to talk about it because that's how you diffuse the situation. You share it with other people because we've all been there and we can all laugh about it. And as a parent, I have had plenty of moments that bring feelings of shame and embarrassment upon me. I think it's just a rite of passage as a parent. Like five years ago when I did something just really, really dumb, to be honest. We were going to be having a family gathering at my parents' place in East Texas, and my brother and his family were driving up from Houston. My sister and her family were flying out from California, and we were just going to have a long weekend together. But unfortunately, my wife could not get off work on that Friday, and so I had this brilliant idea that I would drive four hours in the car with my five-year-old and my two-year-old and my one-year-old. And then Mindy would come on down the next day and join us. So we're about two and a half hours into the journey and things are going great. The two little ones had slept for the entire trip. Ruthie had watched a movie on her iPad, but it was time for a break. It was time for some lunch. And so I found a McDonald's, I pulled into the parking lot. And before I got out of the car, I began to make a mental game plan of how I was going to get in and out of that McDonald's with my three kids and keep them all alive. And so I had a diaper bag over one shoulder. I'm carrying brick with my other hand. I'm I'm telling Ruthie, please hold your sister's hand as we walk across the busy parking lot. And man, you could just see the the pity that people had for me as they saw me. And they they went out of their way to open the door for me. And they're like, man, after you, you, you really need this. And so we're all sitting down, we're eating lunch. Things are great. I am just crushing it as single dad of three at this point. And so we're finishing up lunch, and I begin to realize that that Brick has a dirty diaper. And so I I gather up the diaper bag, I pick him up, I I decide I probably should not leave the two girls by themselves, so I, I tell them to follow me into the guy's bathroom. I pull down the changing table. I'm doing my thing, but Ruthie is now upset because I have made her go into the guy's bathroom. And she is reminding me that she's a girl and she's not allowed to be in here. And so she begins to have a a bit of a minor meltdown and is crying, laying on the bathroom floor. And and so I'm kind of yelling at her and I'm working on the diaper. And and it was was a bad one. It was like the explosive kind, you know, where it's just kind of coming out the sides. And so I am just rolling through the wet wipes and I'm packing up the dirty pants in one of the little baggies. I'm I'm searching for some clean pants. Uh, And at this point, you know, guys are just coming in and out of the bathroom and just kind of looking at me. And it was really, really embarrassing. 
And that diaper, it required so many wet wipes that I, I ran out. And so I had to go to the paper towel machine. And it was at this point that I see out of the corner of my eye that McKenna is playing with a urinal cake. <laughs> so let's talk about shame and embarrassment this morning. We've been in a sermon series called Renewing Strength where we're looking at some of the things that can just beat us down in life and, and how uh, our faith uh, can, can lead us through that. And today we're looking at the emotion of shame and, and how it can hold so many of us back from being the person that Christ has called us to be. Now maybe you've never been in a McDonald's bathroom with one kid crying on the floor and one kid with poop on him and another kid playing with a urinal cake. But we've all been in shameful situations. And many times we can laugh about those things, maybe even use them as a sermon illustration. But here's the reality today that I wanna kinda bring us around. We've all had embarrassing and shameful things happen to us, but all of us, if we're being honest, have embarrassing things about us. Things that bring great shame into our, our hearts. And those are not as much fun to talk about. And I'm not talking about silly, shallow things where we can sit around and laugh about them with our friend. I'm, I'm talking about deep things in our hearts where we say, I don't like this about me. And I don't want this to be true for me. And I don't want other people to know this about me. For some of you, maybe it's something in your past. And you think if, if these people in my life, if they knew these things about me, they wouldn't want anything to do with me. Others of you, maybe it's some, some addictions and some habits that you're not very proud of and you would be mortified if people around you knew these things about you. And this kind of embarrassment and this kind of shame, it's a, a lot less fun to talk about. And yet that's what I want us to talk about this morning because I think all of us deep within us, if we're to be honest with ourselves, we have some, some things about us that bring us shame and humiliation. And I think it's really especially true and amplified in our culture today where everybody is always trying to get a leg up on one another and everybody is putting off this aura that, that we're not just okay, but we are the best and the smartest and the prettiest and the funniest. Because see, when we only see these picture-perfect Instagram posts and we only tweet about our accomplishments, we are left to then begin to compare ourselves to others and we begin to wonder, that, do the shortcomings and the shame that I have in my life, is that just true for me? But the, the reality, again, if we were to be honest with ourselves, is that we all have some things in our life that bring us shame. And I want to talk with us about it this morning by showing you how Jesus arrives on the scene and how he interacts with, with different people. So in the Gospel of Luke, we get just these incredible stories of Jesus going out and ministering to people one after another. And in Luke 5, uh, Jesus is interacting with several different people who are essentially at some of the worst moments in their life. And so if you have your Bibles, I, I want you to turn with me to Luke 5, and I want you to just leave them out on your lap, because we're going to be here in Luke 5 for the rest of the morning. Um, chapter 5 is just story after story of Jesus interacting with people who are at their greatest levels of brokenness and shame. And I want to look at some of these stories today, because I think the way that Jesus interacts with these people in the midst of their shame tells us a lot about how he wants to interact with us in the midst of our shame. So in Luke 5, Jesus comes on the scene and he's preaching powerfully. He's doing miracle after miracle and the crowds are beginning to gather and they're getting amped up. And it becomes too much that, that he can't preach to all of them. So he gets onto Simon Peter's boat and he begins to preach and teach to the crowds from the boat. And after he finishes, he very abruptly turns to Peter in verse 4 and he says, hey, let's go catch some fish. And he says this to him in front of the entire crowd, and Peter has to respond in verse 5 by saying, I just fished all night, and I didn't catch anything. That's pretty embarrassing for him to have to say. Peter, the fisherman, that's how he'd introduce himself. I'm Peter, I'm a fisherman. Now try doing that in front of a few thousand people after not being able to catch any fish. That's humiliating. That's not a great moment for Peter, I think Jesus has just touched down on a place of shame in Peter's life. 
But Peter relents, and, uh, and they cast out their nets. And verse 6 tells us, when they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. And it begins to dawn on Peter in this moment that the powers that have victimized him over which he doesn't seem to have any control, he begins to realize that this guy, Jesus, has control over all of them. And Peter becomes very exposed in this moment. There's no hiding at this point. There's no pretending. There's no justifying. And so Peter does the only thing he can really do at that, for that point. And verse 8 tells us, Simon Peter falls to his knees and he says, Get away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. See, when shame gets in the presence of perfection, it says, Get the light off of me. I, I don't want to be seen like this. And so Peter says to Jesus, you don't want any part of me. You've now seen my bad side. You can go now because you don't want any part of this. And what I love about Jesus is he says, no, I still want you. See, there's a part of us in our shame that we want to push God away. We want to push other people away. But can I share some good news with you this morning? I don't know what feels like maybe it's out of control in your life. I don't know what maybe you feel victimized or shamed about, but Jesus is in the business of taking shame away. Peter says, get away from me, Lord. I'm a mess. But Jesus says, no, Peter, I'm going to actually make you into somebody new, somebody who can change the world. And that's what Jesus can do for each and every one of us. He has the power to take our shame away. So the next guy that comes up to Jesus is a guy that Jesus probably should have gotten away from. And, and this is our scripture text this morning. So uh, I want to read the whole thing with you. Actually, we're just reading verses 12 through 15. So uh, if you would join me in reading, picking up in verse 12. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But now, even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. So after Jesus' encounter with Peter, he comes across a man who, according to our text, is full of leprosy. How's that for a description? Now, not only was this a very contagious disease, but it was a humiliating disease. It was humiliating because you could not hide the fact that you had leprosy. And not just that, but you had to go and live on the outskirts of town, away from everybody. You could not be touched by anyone. Can you imagine the levels of shame and humiliation that this guy must have felt? But here's what's interesting about this story. The man knows that Jesus can make him clean. He doesn't say, if you can. He says, Jesus, if you will. See, the man is confident that Jesus has the ability to heal him. What he's not sure of is if Jesus actually wants to. And I think a lot of us think this way about God sometimes. Some of you today, you're hearing this message of Jesus can take your shame away, and you're saying, yeah, yeah, I, I know that in my head. I'm just not sure I really believe it here. And maybe you hear pastors say things like, Jesus loves you, and you say, yeah, yeah, I know. I'm just not really sure that that's true for me and for my situation. And this man comes to Jesus, and he says, I know you can make me clean. I'm just not sure if you want to. And in verse 13, it says, Jesus stretches out his hand, touches him, and heals him. What must it be like to be someone who has lived in isolation for years, who's never been allowed human contact, to have somebody reach out and touch you? This is uh, Venicio Riva. Uh, as you can tell from the picture, he's had a very difficult life. At the age of 15, he was diagnosed with neurofibrotosis, which is a disease that spreads painful boils all across the body. 
And so you can imagine the looks that this guy gets. His father refuses to touch him. Strangers on the street yell at him and tell him to get away from them. Over and over in his life, he has received the message that you're not wanted. Now, as painful physically as the condition is, uh, the psychological damage is far worse. So several years ago, the Pope was going to be coming near his hometown. And so he and his aunt decided they would go out and just try to catch a glimpse. And so he ended up getting ushered right up to the front of the crowd. And he began to think to himself, maybe the Pope might come over and, and shake my aunt's hand. And maybe he might even smile at me. But instead, what he got was a 60 second full embrace from the Pope. And the Pope put his hands on his head and kissed him. And when they interviewed him later, he said, I felt like I was in paradise. When they interviewed his aunt later, she said he's never been the same since. The way he sees himself and the way he interacts with the world has changed. So in our scripture, this man, a leper, is pushed away from community. And he says, if you're willing... You can make me clean, but Jesus, I'm just not sure that you want to. And Jesus puts his hands on him and he says, I am willing, be clean. Jesus could have simply said, be clean, but he uses the word thalo in Greek and it means I desire. It means I want to. Some of you believe that God can take your shame away. You're just not sure that he wants to. But Jesus says, I desire to and I will. So as you can imagine, after this miracle, Jesus is becoming very popular. People are doing anything they can to get to him. And so what we see next in in the story in chapter 5 is that Jesus is preaching and he's teaching inside of somebody's home. And he's interrupted by some men who carry their paralytic friend up to him and, and he's seeking to be healed. And so at this point, Jesus could have just healed him, but instead of saying, hey, you're healed, be made well, and go, he says, your sins are forgiven. And the religious people in the room, they start freaking out. They are throwing penalty flags left and right. They're saying, only God can say that. You can't say that. That would be like if, if Tom came up and just popped me in the nose, and then Tim walked in and said, it's okay, Tom, I forgive you. That wouldn't make any sense. Jesus does what only God can do. He forgives the man's sins. But in order to show the crowds that he has the authority to do so, he doesn't just forgive the man, but he heals him. And he says in verse 24, stand up, take your mat, and go home. In that moment, Jesus is showing us that he doesn't just want to deal with the external shame and the external problems of our lives. He wants to deal with our hearts as well. He wants to deal with the root cause of so many of our problems, which is sin. Now, I'm not in any way saying that sin is what caused this man to be paralyzed, but what I am saying is that at the root of so much of our shame and humiliation is sin. Sin that you have committed or sin maybe that has committed against you. Maybe for some of you, somebody used sexuality in such a way that they committed a sin against you and they brought shame into your life. It certainly wasn't your fault. You certainly didn't deserve that, but their sin brought shame into your life. Or maybe for some of you, you have used sexuality in such a way that it brought shame into your own life. All of us, at the root of it, There's a thing in our life where we have said, I don't really trust God's prescribed way of managing this, whether it's our sexuality, our money, our pride, our jealousy. And what's going to happen is culture will continually try and offer us another way other than God's way. And it's going to try to convince us that God's way isn't best. But culture is wrong. All we need to do to know how wrong our culture is is to begin to just look around at the pain and the loneliness and the shame that we see all over our world. When we decide that our way is better than God's way, it will often bring in more pain and brokenness and shame into our lives. And so Jesus comes and he says, I don't just want to deal with the external problem, which is your disability. I want to get to the root causes of the pain and the shame in your life. See, that's the beauty of Jesus. 
He says, I want to heal. I want to take shame away. I want to take sin away. I want to make you into who God has made you to be. Now at this point, if they haven't already, all eyes are on Jesus. And I don't think it's a coincidence what he does next. Verse 27 says, Jesus goes out and he sees a tax collector sitting in the tax booth. Now, tax collectors in this time, they were the scum of the earth because you bought the right from the Roman authorities to tax your own people and then you upcharged them and that's how you made money. And so Jesus sees Levi, he walks straight towards him and he says, I want you, follow me. And so Jesus goes to Levi's house and he has a party with all of his tax collector friends. And the religious leaders of the time, they are beside themselves. They cannot get over the fact that Jesus would associate with such people. And I love Jesus' response. And, and we're going to close with this, verse 31 and verse 32. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I love this statement because in two sentences, not only does he express God's heart for each and every one of us, but he dismantles every false assumption that so many people have about Christianity. See, I think Christians and even those who aren't Christians that are just kind of looking in uh, with curiosity from the outside, they tend to lump Christians and, and, and Christianity into to kind of two different camps. So for some of you in here today, um, you think of God as a condemner, and you, you think God just sits there wagging his finger at people and saying, shame on you. Maybe some of you didn't even want to come this morning because you thought that, that you would be judged. And others of you, maybe you came because you felt like you deserved to be judged and you deserved to be pushed away. But Jesus says, no, I don't do that. Do physicians do that? Do doctors go, ooh, you're sick, yuck, get away from me. No, that would be a terrible doctor. Don't go to a doctor like that. <laughs> Doctors hang out with sick people. Jesus says, I'm not here to push sinners away. If you're a mess, that's who I'm looking for. I'm coming for you in the midst of your mess. So you have God as condemner, as one group of people, but there are others uh, who view Jesus as the acceptor. And for you, Jesus is just saying, hey, brother, you get in here and you give me a hug. You're okay. You just do you. You be yourself. You just be comfortable with who you are and you do you. Now, that's the Jesus that culture is generally going to try to feed to us. But listen very carefully to what Jesus says. He says, I am the physician and I came here for the sick. So what's the assumption at the party? Remember, he's sitting around with all of these tax collectors, and he says, I am the doctor, and I'm here for sick people. And they're all like, hey, what are you saying? There's something wrong with us? And Jesus is like, yeah, there is something wrong with you, but I still want to be with you. I'm not condemning you. I'm not pushing you away, but I'm not just accepting either. Because Jesus wants to change us. You don't coddle illness. You don't say, oh, I love this flu. I love feeling all cold and clammy and yet just burning up at the same time. No, it's a parasite, right? And you want to get it out so that you can be fully you. The only requirement is that we've got to acknowledge that we need healing. So how do you get well? When is it that you go to the doctor? Well, it's when you finally relinquish and say, okay, maybe I am sick, even though you've been trying to fake it for the last few days. Well, how do you find wholeness in Christ. If you want a couple takeaways from the sermon, here they are very quickly. Number one, it starts with confession. It starts by admitting, I have some things in my life and in my heart that aren't right. See, a lot of people think Christianity is all about just being a good person. And if you're a good person, then God's going to like you. And while that is true of most of the world religions, that is not what the gospel says. The gospel, that is the good news of Jesus Christ says we don't come to God with our accomplishments. We come to God with our needs and our brokenness and our shame and we come empty handed and we say I've got some questions that I can't answer. I've got some shame that is holding me back and I've got some brokenness in my life that I've been trying really hard to overcome on my own and I just can't do it. 
So after we've admitted our brokenness, I think the second thing we often need to do is to seek help. Quit suffering and isolation. Man, that is so true for what Tom talked about last week with depression. And if you didn't hear that sermon, you need to go back and watch it. And it's true for what he talked about the week before with fear. And it's true for what we're going to talk about next week with anxiety. These kinds of things are not meant to be managed in isolation. You need a discipleship community group. You need an accountability group. Maybe you need to come to celebrate recovery on Monday nights. In some cases, you might need professional help. And we've got a whole list of counselors that we often will refer people to. There's no shame in admitting that you need help. Can I say that again? There is no shame in admitting that you might need help. If you think you might need a counselor, but maybe you're not sure you're ready to quite take that step, let me offer another solution. Get a Stephen minister. Stephen ministers are trained lay people in our congregation that are equipped to provide one-on-one Christian care to those who are hurting, to those who are struggling. And we've got some incredible Stephen ministers here at Asbury. They would love to just come alongside of you in the midst of your struggles. And and our Stephen ministry team is set up in the lobby uh, this morning, and they'd love to visit with you about that. Or maybe, maybe God's calling you to be a Stephen minister, and I know that they would want to visit with you about that as well. So number one, we admit we need help. Number two, we actually seek out that help. And then number three, we need Jesus. We need Jesus. God's response to all of our sin, to all of our brokenness, was to send Jesus Christ to live among us, to live the life that we could not, to die the death that we deserved. Through Jesus' death on the cross, our sin's already been paid for. Jesus Christ conquered death, and he says, because I have beaten death, I can liberate you from that which holds you back. And so if I could offer you just one thing this morning, it would be an invitation to come and to get to know Jesus better. If you've been in a rut lately in your faith, recommit yourself this morning. Recommit yourself to come into worship every single week. Seek out a Sunday morning adult discipleship community. Talk to somebody on our discipleship team or our pastoral staff about some of the different small group opportunities that we have here throughout the week. And if you've never given your heart to Jesus, I would urge you to consider that today. Jesus is the only one who can fill each and every one of your heart's desires. And he's the only one who can take your shame and he can turn it in to a confident humility. A confident humility that exudes the peace and the joy of Jesus. I love that phrase, confident humility. It's one of our core values on staff at Asbury. So we expect every Asbury staff member to have confident humility. And if you think about the opposite of shame, I think about confident humility. And when I think about confident humility, I think about Jesus sitting around the table with his disciples at that Last Supper. Think about the confidence that Jesus had to have had to sit there that night knowing what was coming. And think about the humility that he had to have to sit around that table with men who would turn their backs on him, with Judas Iscariot who would betray him and turn him over to the authorities. And yet he sat down and he had a meal with them and he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take, drink. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you and praise you for this morning. God, we thank you for your word that feeds us and guides our lives and speaks truth into our hearts, God, that speaks light into the dark places. 
Lord, so many of us come here this morning with places of shame in our life. And this morning, God, we want to name those and we want to give those to you. And Lord, we want to come to the table this morning and we want to be made new. And we know, God, by your power and love and grace, you can do that. And so, God, I pray as we receive this holy sacrament this morning, that each and every one of us would have a powerful and unique experience with you, where we would experience your love and grace in a very real, physical, tangible way. And I pray, Lord, that there would be an anointing of your spirit on this place and that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine, that you would make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we would go from this place as the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And now, God, we join together in confidence, praying that prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.